Um, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So before I move on, I'd like to share my, my special thanks to Jake, who, who actually gave a lot of help to me while preparing for this presentation. So good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. So we all love traveling to different regions of the world, since traveling is one of the rare moments that modern people are allowed to um, escape from their daily um, boring routines. And actually, fortunately, unfortunately, if every time we go over borderlines, we actually encounter with a lot of language barrier problems, which, are, which actually makes us into a total fool who can't even order foods in a restaurant or ask people where the restaurant is. So well, there are these kind of translator programs that are actually making our traveling experiences much more exciting. But still, um, whenever we go out, whenever we go to the foreign countries, we actually encounter with these kind of problems. And can we say that these kind of translator programs are the ultimate solution and ultimate direction that we have to promote in the these, in these society of globalization? Today, I'd like to give you a slight twist to this perception, the common perception that we all share in the 21st century about translators and about globalization. So, languages. They develop in order to name certain concepts and brand those concepts with names and labels to be called as. But still, we all know the fact that there are no real um, direct logical connection between these concepts and those labels. For example, we don't have any reason why we call those things as piano, not chairs, for example. But, um, and also, we all know the fact that these labels actually differ from language to language. And actually, people refer to these kind of objects very differently um, according to what kind of language they use and according to what kind of mother tongue they use. So, um, I'd like to give you a very straightforward example here. So, what do we call this in Korean? Yes, it's called a sami. And anyone who can speak Japanese here? Um, so, um, in Japanese, it's just called a para. And also in Russian it's called rosa, and in English it's called a rose. But what happens if we throw these four words into a translator? Everything becomes equal, it means the word of rose. And also, in the famous play written by William Shakespeare, Romeo and Juliet, Juliet once comes up and says, By any other name, a rose would smell as sweet. <laughs> so, both Google Translate and Rome, Juliet believe that Roses, no matter what kind of names, no matter what kinds of labels are they granted with, a rose is always a rose. So today I'd like to concentrate on um, the, the fact that all of these labels, even though these labels actually are derived from exactly the same um, flower, rose, actually each of these labels actually incorporate different kinds of backgrounds, different kinds of meanings, and different kinds of stories. For example, this English word rose, it actually incorporates the, um, the historical background of the British dynasty since the 15th century of the War of the Roses, and also the Korean word changmi. It also, can be, it, it also is personified as a treacherous lady who lures the king in an old traditional Korean novel called Kings of Flowers. So the real story starts here, when different kinds of labels start to shape new forms of concepts. And today, therefore, I'd like to um, tell you about the story, and I'd like to lead you into the world of languages, beyond the level of labels, into the values that lurk behind those things. So the first story is about Hebrew. The Hebrew language is a language that has been spoken for about thousands of years by the Jewish people. And um, we have to go back to 70 AD when the Roman Empire attacked Jerusalem. And after this event, the Jewish people actually maneuvered throughout the whole world, going through a history of exile, of discrimination, and agony. But, and also, this was the same case for the, their own languages, which was Hebrew. And the language was Hebrew was actually assimilated into surrounding cultures and surrounding languages. For example, German, Spanish, and Arabic. But these Jewish people had the same perception that they all shared for the 2000 year period which was that one day they will reunite into one and move to Jerusalem and reconstruct an independent nation state. And one particular man who had this um, 
who had this very um, detailed dream was the Jewish man of, of the name of Elizur ben Yehuda, who was born in 1858 in Russia. And at this, in this period of Europe, Europe was going through a lot of changes in social changes, political changes, and so on. For example, after the Italian reunification, Italy regained its identity, and also countless Eastern European nations regained its own independence from other nations. And these historical events actually held a lot of meaning for the Jewish people, since it proved that the Jewish people's dreams were no longer dreams, but possibilities. So, Elijah ben Yehuda actually plunged himself into a mission to teach the students and revive the language and revive the culture of the Jewish people. So he started with um, teaching his own children Hebrew and making them to become the first native speakers of Hebrew. And also he persuaded other neighbors around him um, to, and persuaded, him, persuaded them to turn, um, teach their children Hebrew. And also he attempted to start um, education of Hebrew in schools officially. And also he attempted to publish um, kinds of um, dictionaries of modern Hebrew. And these kind of attempts actually inspired a lot of Jewish people that even after his death, these kind of attempts continued on and on, which resulted in a total revival of the language within just one generation. So then, what is the main, the main value, the main spirit that made these kind of things possible? So the main thing, the main spirit that gathered all the Jewish people into one was the language of Hebrew. The language of Hebrew was the only spirit, but only but the strongest spirit that even though all the Jewish people were spread throughout the whole world for 2,000 years, even though they lived in different kinds of regimes, different kinds of countries, the language of Hebrew were able to gather all Jewish people into one and help them to reconstruct, the, reconstruct their own um, independent nation state and their own independent culture. So the second story I'd like to talk about today is about, is about the Korean language. So we all know the fact that Korea was once under the domination of Japan during the early 1900s. And during this period, the Korean language went through a lot of dramatic changes, especially because of the sudden influx of foreign languages into the Korean peninsula, especially Japanese. So the Korean language actually, um, a lot of Japanese vocabularies actually settled in the Korean language, even though most of those changes are not being acknowledged as official changes these days, it is still a true fact that it gave a lot of influence when it comes to daily communication between people and daily conversation between people. So uh, we can actually observe these kind of phenomena when we have a conversation with our grandparents. For example, um, my grandparents actually use the word um, pendo, which means lunchbox in English. So then what is the main, the core problem that we have to concentrate, that we have to identify here? The main, the, pro the main problem is that people tend to forget that the main problem is not that we should not speak Japanese or like we should not incorporate any kind of foreign vocabularies in our language. The main problem we have to concentrate here is that people tend to forget that there are clear differences between saying pendo and kushira. There are clear differences saying these two different vocabularies even though the translators, the Google Translate tell us that these two words are exactly the same and they correspond with each other. So in order to look into the, um, the actual vocabularies, the, the actual meanings that these kind of vocabularies hold, we have to go back to the 1930s when the, the Japanese government actually encouraged the Korean people to use the Japanese language in daily lives and also ban the Korean, ban the, um, ban teaching the Korean language in school. If we rephrase these kind of historical events, we come to a conclusion that the, the words that actually settled in Korea during the 1930s, especially during the 1930s, are not just mere Japanese words. They, are, they actually embrace the imperialistic ambitions of the past Japanese regime and that they had upon the Korean Peninsula. So using these kind of um, words actually means something more than just using Japanese 
The last three I'd like to tell you about today, and also I'd like to tell you about the Naisen Ittai ideology, which was one of the most commonly used ideology by the Japanese regime to justify their domination of Korea. So the last story I'd like to talk to you about today is about the battle fish, which is a fish, which is a very strange fish that, fish that appears in the novel The Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy. So before I move on, I'd like to show you a short um, film. So, you can watch it. This is the scene from the movie itself, about, about explaining about the average. Okay, so if we can't really um, properly do the video, then we can just move on to the presentation. Because my presentation is perfect. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, moving on. Um, the slides, please. <laughs> so just, I'll just continue on explaining about the battle fish. So this battle fish, the very creature that the battle fish that comes out at the novel The Hitchhiker's Hitchhiker Guide to the Galaxy. So this is a very peculiar creature. If you pluck this fish into your mind, into your ear, and it automatically translates all kinds of languages that you hear, rendering it perfectly comprehensible. So, um, the novel also says that due to these kind of creatures, the wars and the conflicts and the disputes that are going on throughout the whole world vanished and they were all solved. But then, the novel then comes up and gives us a small riddle, saying, The battlefish was one of the most, um, one of the one of the worst inventions in history because of because it caused a lot of conflicts and international conflicts and international disputes. So I don't really think that this is just a mere meaningless paradox. So what this actually means that in order to see what these actually means, we have to see what kind of traits these kind of languages have. So the word language is actually. Used with the, often used with the word language barrier. So we often use the word language barrier. And this actually implies the fact that people often perceive languages as barriers and as obstacles in the middle of the road to effective communication between people from different ethnic groups, different countries, different religious groups, and so on. And maybe some people might think that these kind of languages cause these kind of disputes between um, a lot of nations and a lot of, a lot of um, identity, a lot of groups. But actually, these, these kind of um, language barriers are being demolished in the current society, are being demolished and vanishing in the 21st century. Especially, um, for example, there is this um, language of Esperanto, which was made as a result of an attempt to make a universal language that can be used and understood and learned easily by anyone on the group, regardless of their nationalities, their mother tongue, and, and so on. And also, the attempts to... Um, also, the kids in schools, they end up saying that we want to use Spanish or Chinese classes because all of these things, all of these Google Translator things are going to do the job for us. But is it truly the fact? I believe that this kind of globalization needs much more than that. It needs much more than just simply learning, simply learning languages and simply learning a lot of languages without, the, without learning the meanings and benefits behind them. So genuinely revving up globalization needs much more than that. Learning and knowing what kind of values, what kind of people, what kind of cultures are hidden behind those languages. Learning and knowing why certain Korean words should be reconsidered in usage. Learning and knowing why, why the Hebrew language actually stands a lot, actually is a very meaningful language for the Jewish people. Learning and knowing all these kind of things is very important when we shout for globalization every single day. Thank you very much.
Thank you.